who's got a notification. I knew there was something. Awesome. Thanks. <laughs> no problem. Okay. Um, all right. Hello, everyone. Uh, today I'm presenting chapter six on functions. I have to say it was a really heavy chapter. And so please stop me if I'm saying something wrong, like just, just correct me right then. And uh, I think after reading this, I have like at best a superficial understanding of these things um, because many of the intricacies I have not had to use them in my work till now. But hopefully after the discussion, I'll understand better from, you know, from our discussion. So just, yeah, feel free to stop me anytime. Um, so we'll start with the basics. I'm going in the same order as the chapter is. Um, there are three components uh, to functions. The argument, also called the formals, which is the X or Y or the arguments around which you make your functions. Um, the body, which is what the function does. So the code inside the function. And the, finally, the environment. Uh, which basically dictates how the function finds the values associated with the names. Um, environment is uh, usually specified implicitly, implicitly based on where you define the function. Um, so the exception to what I said earlier are primitive functions. Um, they exist primarily in C. So anything that for the for three components, formals, body, or environment will return null value. And they're only found in base R. So some examples are like, you know, the base R functions like sum or the square brackets. And you can use type of, as a, given in this example, to see that um, they are primitive functions like built-in or special. Um, so our functions are also objects, like there are objects like other things and this quality is called first class. So they are first class functions because of this quality. What this also means that they don't need a special syntax for defining and naming a function. You typically create a function object using function and bind it to a name with the assignment arrow. The binding step is not necessary. So you can just have like a temporary function um, and just use it and you know forget about it if you just have a temporary use. So for example, here in LApply MT cars, this function X, which uh, calculates the length of unique um, values in a variable, uh, it's not bound to any other um, name. Um, so invoking a function, you just call a function by the name by default. But what if you have the arguments already in a data structure? Um, so you can use do, do, do call, do dot call to invoke such a function. So for example, here you have your, in this example, you have your arguments that are a list of one to 10 and you can do a mean, um, call the mean function on the arguments using do call. Okay. So function composition, how can you, what are the different ways to write the functions? Um, so the first one is nesting, where you just create incremental um, parentheses, as you can see from, from this function. Um, it is, it can be hard to read. So it is only well suited for short sequences. Next is intermediate objects. So you have like a sequence of um, actions to be taken and you um, just name the intermediate objects and pass the na that name to the next step. Um, so here you have to think of the intermediate names, which is kind of a, not a big uh, con, but just, just a con. Um, and if you, your intermediate objects are important, then this approach can be useful. And from tidyverse, we know about piping. Um, so where the pipe operator can be read as and then, so X and then apply deviation and then apply square and then apply mean. 
Um, so this definitely makes for a more readable code. Uh, it does require third party packets. So if the user is using Tidyverse, it's second nature to know piping, but it just ne needs that knowledge. Okay. So next is um, scoping or lexical scoping, which is the method that R uses. Um, basically scoping means how does R find values associated with a name? So the governing principle here is uh, it looks up the values of names based on how a function is defined and not how it is called. Okay. So the four rules of lexical scoping, uh, we'll go through them one by one. The first is name, mas name masking. What this means is that the, uh, this, according to this rule, the names defined within the function mask names outside the function. So if you have names that are within the function, they, are, they are take precedence over the um, names outside. So for in this example, we define X is 10, Y is 20, but again, we, once we define the function G02, we again redefine them within the function as X is one and two. And so the return value, when you call G02, it takes up the, um, uh, it takes up the values one and two, which are defined, uh, defined inside the function. Um, if, the uh, name isn't defined uh, in the function, R will look one level up. So in this example, uh, this is changed. So y, uh, X, y is defined within, but X is not defined. So R goes back up in uh, one level up and sees that X is defined as two outside the function and takes up that value. Um, if we just look up at y, y in the environment and not within the function, it is still 20, like the previous example. And just like with the variables, the same rule applies for a function. So if a function is defined inside, that will mask its definition outside the function. Um, so once again, since the functions are objects, uh, scoping rules also apply to functions, just like variable names. Um, now what happens if you use the same name for a function and non-function object? Basically, R will ignore the non-function object and give the function object more importance. Um, so this example, um, we can see G09 is defined here um, and G10 is defined here, but as G09 is a function in the top, but inside G10, it is actually a variable also. So when you call G10 and it's looking up the value of G09, it looks up the function and not the variable. This is a, this was a confusing example to understand for me, but anyway, Hadley recommends that, you know, just don't use the same name for different things. It's a bad idea and it is confusing. Um, okay, uh, so the next uh, rule of uh, scoping is that every time a function is called, a new environment is created to host its execution. And each invocation is completely independent. Um, so if we follow this example, um, when you, uh, G11, uh, if you call G11 the first time, it will give you this, it, it, both times it will return the same value, uh, because the function, it doesn't have any, the function doesn't have any way to remember what happened in the past. So every time you run it, it's like, I'm born now and I'm running now. So it's just, it will, it will run from scratch. So each run is independent, completely independent. And the last um, rule of uh, scoping is, um, lexical scoping is dynamic lookup. So R looks for values when the function is run, not when the function is created. So in here, um, we have, this is just a simple function that adds a one to your x value and um, and here uh, when the function is defined x is defined as 15 when you run it then it gives you the value 16 but in the second run uh, x is defined as 20 um, and it will return 21 so 
are looks for values when the function is run, not when the function is created. So what this also means is if there is a spelling mistake in the code, um, the R didn't execute the function when you created it. So you won't get an error message when you create the function. Um, to, um, to a workaround in that is to detect any problem, you can use code tools to detect the external dependent dependencies. So like the example here, uh, you, uh, code tools, um, find globals G12 will show that it depends on the plus and the X. Okay. Um, next topic is uh, lazy evaluation. So, uh, so I've seen when I, uh, execute my code, I see lazy evaluation or evalu lazy evaluating, and I never understood what that was, but I think I understand a little bit now. Um, so in our function, arguments are lazily evaluated. That is, they are only evaluated if accessed. In my head, I think of it as they are only evaluated when they are needed. Otherwise, you know, it can, it can just sit there and it won't, um, it's okay, no harm, like no harm, then you can have those extra arguments. Um, so for example, in this uh, function, which uh, has the argument x, um, we never, uh, uh, if you, if instead of x you have stopped, this is an error, you'll still get a 10 and not an error because the x is never used. You're just, this x01 is just going to return 10 every time. Um, so whatever you include there instead of x, it won't matter because it, the function doesn't need that value. So lazy evaluation is powered by promise, which is a data structure which governs how the lazy evaluation is done. Um, a promise has three components, an expression, an environment, and a value. So an expression like x plus y, which uh, gives rise to the delayed computation, um, an environment where the expression should be evaluated um, and a value which is computed and cached the first time a promise is accessed when the expression is evaluated in the specified environment. So um, I, don't, I don't understand this very well. Um, like I don't have an intuitive understanding of this. So if anyone now, if they want to chip in or later like explain, what what this this example I and I don't understand this example. Um, that that will be great. Um, so uh, so continuing with lazy evaluation, um, how that happens? Uh, default arguments can be defined um, within uh, the function in terms of arguments and variables defined later in the function, but hardly really you know does not recommend defining variables later in the function because it makes the code harder to understand and you need to know the exact order of evaluation. Um, so um, missing arguments, so we can use missing function to see if the arguments uh, value when the function is called comes from the user or from um, default. So in this example, the uh, default sub supplied value is x equal to 10. Um, and if we run it without a user defined value, um, the first time um, it will use the default value and you'll get a, um, and return true to indicate that it's using a default value. And when it is using um, a user defined uh, value, um, the logic argument will re return false. Okay, and this is very useful, the dot, 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 or ellipsis. So functions can take any number of named and unnamed arguments using the ellipsis. And you can also extend really sophisticated functions or use those functions inside your functions without having to repeat all the um, arguments in the function. So you can pass arbitrary number of functions to your function. Um, for example, uh, so this example is from this link, it's not from the book, uh, uh, where you're making a plot function and using the 
base plot function, but not defining all the arguments in this. And this is possible because you can use ellipses. So here we just define plot x and y and color is red. But when you call the function, because we used ellipses, we can go, we can count on all the arguments that are listed in plot and we can use that when we are calling red plots, for example, x, x, la uh, x label and y labels, even though we did not specify this explicitly when defining the function. So this is super useful. Okay, um, exiting a function. So functions can exit in two ways. Um, they either return a value or indicate, um, indicating success in evaluation or they throw an error. So um, first is, uh, this is more obvious, uh, implicit versus explicit return. So implicit return is when the function just returns the last value that it evaluated in this if else. Um, zero or 10 are uh, the implicit returns or instead of just if, if it can be explicitly stated by adding return to the last evaluation um, expression. Okay, um, some functions return invisible values. For example, the most common uh, function is the assignment operator. So if we as assign a um, five to variable a and it doesn't unless you print it there won't be it won't return any value um, other functions can be made to uh, made invisible by applying invisible explicitly to the last value that is to be evaluated and after applying invisible if you want to still verify if the value exists you can do that by using print or wrapping the function in parenthesis Okay. Um, if a function cannot complete its assigned task, it should throw an error and that can be specified by using the stop, uh, stop function within the function with a message, which indicates the terminations of the function execution. Exit handles, handler, so the, again, this was also very difficult to understand because um, I just, couldn't picture how, how you would implement it or like couldn't relate to the example here. Um, but uh, yeah, so it will be great to have a discussion on this. Um, so exit handlers can be used to undo any changes made to the global environment automatically after the function exits. So for example, this function on exit, it should display goodbye message irrespective of how it is evaluated. So even if it is if it's true, it says goodbye. If it's false, it says goodbye. Um, I think there's a more sophisticated, there's also a more sophisticated example in the book which deals with um, direct directories, like which looks like it could be really useful. Like after you exit the function, you switch directories or something. So if anyone has more, understands that and they could explain it, that will be great. Um, I, I did not understand it. Okay. Um, now function forms, not all function calls look the same. Um, there are some more common and less common forms. Um, so the most one common one is the prefix form. Um, any function can be written in prefix form, uh, which, is, uh, which is what we see the most, where the function name comes before the arguments. It, it does help better understand the structure of the language and, language, and there are exercise, in the exercises, if you've done that, then you can practice writing functions in the prefix form. Um, so for example, x plus, instead of x plus y, we could have the plus um, function outside of the, which is a function name, um, and the arguments in the parenthesis. Um, and similarly, the names assignment and for, uh, this, these are all examples of how you can rewrite functions in prefix form. Okay, um, when, you, when the functions are written in the prefix form, you, they can be matched by position. They could be uh, partially matched, like instead of topic, uh, help top equal to mean, or uh, by full name, like help topic equal to mean. 
Um, so Hadley again warns here that use a positional matching only for the first one or two arguments. Um, they are which are most commonly used and most readers will know what they are um, and don't go beyond that and just never use partial matching <laughs> knowingly. Uh, okay. Uh, the next is infix form. Um, I think this is super useful uh, where the function name comes in between this argument like just x plus y and user uh, user defined uh, users can also define the their own infix functions, uh, which begins with uh, a percentage sign. Um, and this is one example of uh, um, user-defined function for paste, pasting characters together. Um, the name is really flexible. It can contain any sequence of characters except percentage sign itself. Okay. Um, and I, yeah, so this is the, um, another form is a replacement form where the function replaces values by assignment um, and the, it should have three components, a special name with an assignment operator um, and should have the arguments that is X and the value that is to be assigned and it must return the modified object. Um, then there are special forms which we have already seen throughout the chapter. Um, so they don't, they're not consistent. Some examples are the parentheses, if, for, um, knowing the name of these functions, like the specific name of the functions that un underlies the form is useful for getting documentation. Um, so if you do just help and parentheses, uh, question mark and parentheses, that's the example that is in the book. It will throw an error, but if you put it under quotations because you know the parenthesis is, is that that's the name of the um, function, um, you'll get help for that. Um, and all of these special forms are implemented as primitive functions. So that means if you're printing these functions, it will not be informative. Um, and that's it. Um, thank you so much. Thanks, Manakshi. Yeah, awesome job. I had a I had a hard time with this chapter just in terms of like focusing, and I think that you're going through it again actually like helped knock a couple things loose. So <laughs> I agree with Abby. It is it a long and challenging chapter and reading it through the first time I had trouble grasping some of um, some of the examples. So thanks for taking the time. Yeah, you uh, spoke about prom promises um, in the data, stru data structure, and um, yeah, I had trouble with that first example in there with the or the environment where it says you know, I can just share for, for a second. Um, uh, I like that it's also called a thunk, apparently. The promise, pro, it says promises or likely a thought. You guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Sorry, I just had to take off my headphones. Okay. Um, yeah, a, th a thunk. That's really fun. Um, yeah, so this example here uh, where you have why. Um, can you see my screen, by the way? The, exa the, the chapter? Yeah. Okay. This, uh, so this example where y is assigned to 10. 10 is assigned to y and then you have a function that has a y as assignment of y in the function but then if you pass y to the function it this doesn't get evaluated and it's 10 10 plus one um oh i see never mind i get it now because <laughs> what's returned is just x plus one right uh it's it's whatever's passed to the function 
Is that right? Well, I, I think the point is that you have Y defined two different ways in the mm -hmm. environment of the function and then in the higher environment. And so it will evaluate the function in the environment that you're in right now. Got it, got it, got it. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Thank you. Less confusing than I thought, okay. <laughs> All right, never mind then. All right, thanks. Uh, but if you go down farther, um, yeah. where they explain the promise. I also have difficulty understanding that, the calculating example there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the way I'm interpreting this is that you're doing an operation twice on X, but it's only running the function once because after it does it the first time it's cached. And then the second time, it's simply calling back that cached value. That's my guess at it, but I don't know if anybody has a better idea. Yeah, it seems like it's evaluating double 20 first and then it's taking whatever that return value is and then evaluating h3 with that value so calculating would only have to show up once it's so tricky well uh, comparing it to, to a quantum state doesn't really help me understand it any better so I was actually really confused about this one too. And just like after someone just said that, the insight I think though is like, is what this is, a, is I think so like in H03, now that I look at it, like for the fifth time, it seems like if you didn't know about this caching thing, maybe you would think that because X is in there twice, it would get evaluated twice. Like that's the thing I missed. I don't know if anybody else missed that, but like the expectation is like, oh, X is there twice. So it's gonna evaluate it each time it's there. And I think the point of this is like, no, that's not happening. And we can see it because it says calculating only once. But so I just, maybe that was obvious and other people saw that, but I felt like I wasn't supposed to get I didn't get what I was supposed to be expecting until just now and like why this should be a little bit surprising, but now I kind of think I see it. Yeah, I think I'm in that same boat. I think maybe it's probably my like actual lack of technical programming knowledge that just made me think, yeah, this is, this is, if this is how I would do it. Um, if I was, this is how I assumed it worked. Um, yeah, but that makes a lot, that makes more sense actually. Yeah, when I read it, I was like, yeah, just calculate it once. Of course, that's how it works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like it's for following orders of operations, but it's not like transitive. It can't actually be separated out into the function, right? Because otherwise you could calculate it twice. So it, it kind of follows the logic of how you would think it should work. Uh, I've never thought about that from like the fact that it's, it has some logic to it and the whole idea of a promise. So is that something that I'm trying to like think function oriented about this stuff. So is that something that has to do with the environment? Like, um, I mean, maybe I just, I don't really have like a great understanding of what environments are or like what they mean, but so the double, you know, operates on 20 and now X is a value that exists in the environment that then the function H03 can find. Is that, Anyone know if that's like off base, on base? I think double creates, uh, it has an, it creates an environment and then it returns. Um, so it's X value is 20 and then it returns two times X. Okay. And then that environment is now done. And now there's a new X value that gets passed into H03, which is 40. And inside its environment, it concatenates it twice. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. That's helpful.
And actually, what was the second thing that you wanted to go over? The exit handlers and the example about the um, directories. Um, and then basically, if anyone has used this and how have you used it? And they, where, like how to think about, okay, now I could use an exit handler right now. <laughs> I'm only thinking about ways to use it wrong by putting a garbage collector in. <laughs> so I, I hadn't used return very often, um, but it seems that when, uh, like you can use return if you want to like get out of the function at that point. So it had like, if this, then return, um, else, whatever, return. And then if you had more steps, they wouldn't have happened because once you hit return, it would have like exited the function. Um, Oh man, my computer wants to restart. I hope it's not going to do that right now. Um, I don't know. Are you able to bring that back up on the screen? That that section with the the on exit. Yeah. This. Try. This like finally clicked for me like this weekend because <laughs> I was using it for something. You're using an exit handler? No, just like a lot of returns. Oh, okay. Yeah. So like in this example, if you had moved that on exit after the if else statement, it wouldn't even hit. Because once it hit return 10, it like left the function. Like it was over. So if you have like more steps after that, it like doesn't, it, it, it won't, um, yeah, it like stops running at that point. Okay. Um, so he wanted to print goodbye every time the function was over. So maybe you have like some long running task and you want it to do something when it ends. Um, like maybe you want it to beep. I use beeper a lot. So beeper is like a nice package and you can say like beep when this is done. Uh, when I do package development, some of the, the checks can take a couple minutes. So I usually get distracted and then I want to know when it's over. Um, so you can say like on exit beep. Um, and then when the function's over, it, it would do that. Or in this case, he was like printing goodbye. Um, but yeah, but so if that step had ha happened after these return conditions, um, especially because it's if else, right? So like one of them are, is going to, to run. So um, both of them would exit the function. You would never get to the step where it said on exit. Does that make sense? I don't know if I explained that well. Yeah, I'm just, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was, I was going to say that. I had, a, I had a stupid question, which is, is beeper spelled with just an R or with an E-R? Just an R. <laughs> yep, go figure. All right. <laughs> Old school. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, that made a lot of sense, Jake. Um, what I was wondering is, like, like, I think a lot of the time, or in the cases of the past, I've done that type of thing where, like, I put something right after the function is completed and not, like, it, as is on exit. But I guess... The advantage with this is that you can do kind of conditional on exits, right? Like depending on how or where it exits. Like is that like can you put that on exit in multiple places? And then say like if if you if you pass through these three levels of conditions, do this. If you exit early, do this, you know. Um, I don't know. Or is it like is is on exit just a, a kind of a whole like a you know, like you can only have one on exit, you know, action. I think you can only have one on exit action, um, but it being conditional or not. So if it wasn't an if else, if it was just an if statement, so it was like, if this is true, then like return. Um, I think, I think you could have like the on exit after, so there's like more steps. So you said like if X return and then, um, then you might have else and do a bunch of other stuff. And you could put the, the on exit inside that. Um, I think that that would, I could like write up a little example and send it, send it over. Um, but yeah, I think, I think you can move on exit around depending on, um, yeah, how that logic is organized. I so think there's a- put in the elf, else condition, or if it was just an if statement, you could put it, um, put it after that. So it would say like, if whatever returns, so then it would like stop and be over. Um, 
And then because that condition didn't happen, then the function would continue running. You would hit that on exit command. And then, yeah, when the function finally returned, you would, you would get it to print or beep. If, uh, if we scroll down in this section 6.7.4, I think there's an example of using multiple on exit uh, statements to, to kind of customize and also keep local uh, what happens upon exiting. Is it this one? It, it is that section, but if you scroll down a bit. Okay. This is I have exercises here, so this one. And then before this, it's the directory example. Uh, uh, sorry, Manakshi, uh, we're seeing your, um, not your slides, but your um, advanced art book. Uh, so if you can scroll down to the book. Oh, okay, sorry. Mm -hmm. Oh, in my slides, I just have this what, this example. Um, I do you want to share your screen? Actually, that may be easier, and I can stop sharing. Sure, let's do that. Okay. Okay, I've, I've got a little background sound here, so I apologize. So this is the start, uh, this is the example uh, uh, in the slide, but if we go down here, there's another example there. Are they talking about, you can put cleanup code directly next to the code that requires cleanup. So what you can do, I guess, is in this example, you're setting um, different functions and then having an on exit. If this is called, then this is what's going to be returned. But if this is called, then this is going to be what's returned. I'm not sure I fully understand it, but it does seem to be uh, analogous to uh, what um, sorry, Jake, I believe, was saying, which is uh, with returns. You have this advantage of, of a flow, uh, control of flow, but coupled with a with a um, uh, changing the global state. So you're re you're not just returning a message, you're not just stopping the flow, but you're also uh, running a a function that restores some state, so that you ensure that you haven't screwed up everything by running your 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 function. That's my understanding, but. Again, I don't understand it fully. I need to understand these examples better. I mean, that, that makes sense to me. And I, I, I kind of conceptually understand this idea of needing to restore the environment somehow like that. That makes sense. I think I probably just like would need to see it in action or use it more to sort of intuitively understand what I was doing with that. So I'm sure we'll get to that down the line. I bet this will come back up. Okay, um, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna head out because again, uh, some ambient noise here. Uh, and also we, for those of us who are doing the stats course, that's gonna start in 15 minutes. I think there are a few people in this group who are doing stats. So I'll see you all in that course in a few minutes. Yeah, see on the flip side, I just saw that one. That's why I was distracted. I was like, Wait, what's the stats course? 
Harold. <laughs> Just that bio Harold. stats course um, that's on the Arbor Data Science Slack. Oh, nice. Yeah, uh, if anyone, if, yeah. if anyone would like to join in, it's 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 really just gotten started, and the only things we've covered are the basics of algebra. And today, Asma is going to present about linear algebra, and then next year, I'm next week. Next week, I'm supposed to um, um, do some probability. Cool. I don't know how probable that is. Oh, this looks fun. Nice. It, 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 is, it is for biostats, uh, which are stats that I guess have blood, blood running through them. Um, I've, <laughs> I've never quite understood biostats. It's like bioethics, it's in there just ethics. But uh, anyway, um, uh, so I, but I do think it's going to get into a lot of, of um, uh, understanding statistical tests to be run and interpreting them, uh, experimental design, which is important in biological research. But, um, uh, and the, the book is available for free online. It's not a, a fancy book, um, but it starts with the ABCs. Uh, you know, like I said last week, it was just how do you set up an algebraic function, or algebraic equation. So um, if you want to jump in on that one, uh, there will be in the Slack a Zoom link probably posted by Ozma uh, within a few minutes. Cool. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, does anyone have anything else that they were confused about or wanted to discuss uh, today? Is anyone using the other forms besides from just the prefix form for defining functions? No, I haven't. No. Maybe, the, no, not knowingly the replacement form. I think I've used other people's functions that use a replacement form, but. Yeah, I think the dot, 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 uh, uh, ellipses um, uh, uh, piece, I think I'll, it'll probably be the thing I'll use first. Like I'll see, I think I'll, I, th I can think of a lot of cases where I could, could have used that, I think in the past, but. Um, so I think I'll, I don't know, that's the one I'm kind of looking for to apply first, but uh, in terms of what coming out of this chapter. Other thing I was thinking with the exit handlers um, and the uh, like writing your own functions is I, something came up today when I was doing something at work is uh, like logging, has anyone ever done anything with like with logging in R? Like uh, you know, keeping uh, you know like a, a log of every uh, like everything that's like printed or like all the errors and everything like that, like in one file. Like I've never, I don't know, I've ne I don't know of, like how to do that, and I was just wondering if anyone else has done that. I've never used it, but I'm imagining you could you could save off CSVs or things like that, or even do like save a list as a JSON and then read that same list in and save that list again kind of thing. It's like appending to the same thing. So you could do logging that way. There's got to be smarter ways, but I could see that being a conceivable way to track um, pieces of information that you kind of need outside the function and outside R, I guess. Right. I've seen with text files and CSVs where you can add append equals true, and so it just keeps adding a line to it. Um, we don't have to like keep reading it in or writing it back out. You can just say keep appending. Yeah. I think you read it. Does anyone have anything else uh, they'd like to talk about? Or? All right. Uh, well, uh, I, so Mike, just, I guess we could wrap up then. Um, what I was wondering about is anyone, does anyone, uh, did you discuss last or two weeks ago about presenting after this week or uh, is there a presenter? Uh, 
because uh, I wasn't there two weeks ago. Uh, I don't know that there was any commitment to anything beyond functions. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. Does anyone want to present on environments uh, next week? All right. I can do it. Take time, but not next week. Okay. Chapter, chapter nine. All right. I'll, how about I'll do environments? Um, I'm presenting yet, and then uh, uh, Jay, he said you'll do nine. Okay. Cool. Um, environments is seven, so. Seven. So Sorry. then we need, we still need eight. Eight, yeah, yeah, yeah. Conditions. Yeah, but we can figure that out next week or something if, uh, if no one is, you know, volunteering right now. But um, uh, cool. Okay. Well, then I'll add that, and I'll, I can I can do next week. Um, and uh, yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, well, thanks. Thanks, y'all. Everyone, thanks, uh, Minoski. Sorry, Minoski. Is that is that closer? Minakshi. Minakshi. Okay, Minakshi. Sorry. Um, uh, yeah. Thank you. Awesome presentation. Uh, I think it was really clear for like a really difficult set of concepts. So thank you, um, and hope to see you all next week. Thank you, thank guys. You, thank you, Minakshi. Thank you, Minakshi. Yeah, thanks, Manachi. Have a good night. Have Bye. fun in stats. <laughs> <laughs>